Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. As some longtime listeners may know, I have a particular fondness for gin. It's a lovely spirit. It's light, yet complex, and from a distiller's standpoint, it is a wonderful opportunity to put your fingerprint on a spirit by creating your own unique botanical profile in the gin that you make. Our guest this week is David T. Smith, author of The Gin Dictionary, who was happy to pull up a mic and share with us his personal journey through the wide world of gin. He was also kind enough to donate a signed copy of the Gin Dictionary, so we'll be doing a giveaway on the day this episode goes live, August 8th, 2018. If you want a chance to win the book, all you got to do is keep an eye on our Instagram page at Modern Bar Cart on that day, August 8th, and we'll be posting a giveaway picture with detailed instructions on how to win the signed copy of the Gin Dictionary. But for now, I think it's time to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Pink Gin. And if we're being really nitpicky, this isn't technically a full-blown cocktail. It's just gin and Angostura bitters. And as we all know from the development of the old-fashioned cocktail, a cocktail has the spirit, bitters, and sugar. Now, Angostura does technically have a bit of sweetness to it, so we could split hairs on this topic until we're blue in the face. But instead, let's just be pink in the glass and be done with it. To make a pink gin, you'll need, very simply, two ounces of gin and two to four dashes of aromatic bitters, depending on your taste. Angostura is usually the bitters that's recommended with this recipe. You'll combine these in a mixing glass with ice, stir for about 20 seconds until it's well mixed, and then strain into a chilled stemmed cocktail glass. Dilution and coldness are key for this drink, since it's basically a crazy dry martini. So if you're someone who doesn't usually go out of your way to chill the glass, trust me, this is one recipe where it's going to make a big difference. I'd also like to give a few thoughts on the color of this drink, which is obviously important. If you tell somebody you're going to make them a pink gin, they're going to expect something that's actually pink, so it pays to execute on that front. The two most widely available brands of aromatic bitters out there, at least in most American markets, are Angostura and Peychaud's Bitters. Both of these brands employ some sort of coloring to make their bitters either a tawny brown in the case of Angostura or a cherry red in the case of Peychaud's. Obviously, this coloration is going to translate into the drink, especially if there's no other ingredients to kind of muddy the waters. Now, for better or for worse, These coloring agents are largely artificial, so if you're willing or eager to dispose of those additives in your cocktails, and if you're the kind of person who really likes an extremely dry cocktail, then I'd implore you to check out our line of embitterment bitters. We never sweeten and we never use artificial colors, only what comes from the herbs, citrus, and spices that we use. So, because Pink Gin is lovely, we're gonna give you a cool little discount code just for being a podcast listener. Head on over to modernbarcart.com, grab a bottle of our excellent bitters, if what we were just talking about sounds nice, and maybe a Modern Bar Cart t-shirt, and then use the discount code PINKGIN, all one word, at checkout to receive 10% off your entire order through August 9th, 2018. And now, back to the Gin Dictionary. In this interview, some of the topics I cover with David T. Smith include the fascinating world of spirits judging and awards, essentially all those cool medals your favorite distillers keep winning, how David fell in love with gin and became the author of this gin-driven reference guide, a stroll through the most common botanicals used to make gin around the world, some discussion of different gin styles, both old and new, dry and sweet, aged and unaged, how to properly operate a martini tester, why Timothy Dalton might not be the worst James Bond, keyword being might, and much, much more. 
I really enjoyed this conversation with David T. Smith, and if you have even a passing interest in gin or gin-based cocktails, so will you. So without further ado, let's talk gin. David, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. So today we are speaking with David Smith, who is the author of The Gin Dictionary. Is that correct? That is correct, yep. Uh, so as we like to do starting out, could you just introduce yourself to our listeners and give your, give a brief background and um, maybe talk a little bit about what you do? Of course, yeah. So I'm David Smith, uh, often written down, referred to as David T. Smith with the middle initial there, um, just because there's a lot of David Smiths around. Um, so I'm a writer, um, a spirits writer, uh, and uh, judge for various international competitions. But my specialty is in gin, and I do a whole host of other different things, working with new distillers and old distillers and history and all that sort of thing. Okay, and... I'm just curious about this this judging. It seems like you've recently been doing some spirits judging, and I, I know it's not super related to gin or, or your book that we'll be discussing here, but it's fascinating to me. So I was wondering if you could just tell our listeners what goes into judging spirits, uh, whether it's you know a, a kind of international competition or, or something maybe a little bit more on the small side. Yeah, sure. I mean, I do a combination of different uh, competitions. Some are just sort of UK based and some are international. The one I've recently been doing has been a more international one um, where they probably get something like three or four thousand spirit centre, something like that. It's quite a lot. And I spent a few, well, quite a few days judging that. It's all blind judging and you have different judges, experts of the different things around the world. So I've been doing a combination of different things. I started off with some of the Asian spirits, such as Baiju, which is a very interesting and upcoming category. Uh, and also I've done some vodka and some liqueurs. Did uh, a day of vermouth, which was particularly fascinating and lovely to see so many new vermouths on the market. And then a whole week of judging gin. We had about 600 entries for gin. I didn't judge all the 600. I judged about a third of those. But still, it was a lot of gin that we had to taste, again, from all over the world, Every, Every continent was sending gin in for this competition. One of the things that occurs to me when it comes to judging spirits is that I imagine, obviously, there are categories, like you said, just like in a dog show, for example, there's the, the herding class and the, the, the working class or the, 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 you know, the, the toy class or whatever it is. Do you use a set of criteria or normative guidelines to identify things like typicality and then quality yes yes we do and actually it's something that because particularly with gin as that's what we're talking about we're having to update these every year because we're there's so much innovation that's going on so for example we'll look at the very sort of classic london dry gins and they'll be judged on a certain criteria but then some of the more contemporary more modern styles of gin they'll be judged separately and things like flavor gins which is particularly popular in the uk and in europe at the moment they will be judged in their own section and old tom is another example and, and aged as well i think we've probably had 30 or 40 different aged gins enter and so they have to be judged separately you mean judging a an aged gin versus a sort of a classic london dry they're just not the same sort of product so we need to separate those out. And the chair judges, I mean, I'm one of the chair judges, but there are others as well. They discuss and they lead the judges with a little um, introduction as to what is typical of the uh, category. And then we go and judge. And we very much judge as a panel. And it's an expertise from about five or six different people. Right. It's really, I think, a good thing that, that you have that initial little kind of chat to get you all on the same page. I remember when I first started grading papers uh, for an English department at one of the universities here in the United States, We uh, all of the new teachers had to go through a very similar process where we all looked at the same paper and discussed what made it this type of grade so that there was at least some sort of standardization across the board. Yeah, certainly. And you have to, you have, to have it. I remember one of the products we had was a mastic 
liqueur, um, which is a flavour quite popular sort of in Greece and around that sort of area of the Mediterranean. And if you don't know what mastic tastes like, there's no way that you could really judge it properly. It's a sort of ancient chewing gum, really. Uh, it's quite, and actually the liqueur was very good. But that's a really good example of you had to kind of set the scene so that the judges could understand it and then mark it accordingly. Right, right. So let's talk about gin right now, because this is obviously the topic of your book, and it's something that, that you have a great deal of expertise um, with regards to, I, I'm sure, everything from the production methods to the history to some of the more esoteric aspects. So can you start us off with just a, a definition of what gin is? Of course, yeah. So gin is a spirit which has been flavoured with botanicals, and these are typically herbs and spices, peels, fruits, leaves, roots, all these sorts of things. And generally, it's flavoured through distillation. So you put the botanicals in the spirit, and then you distill it. And that's there are other ways of doing it, but that's typically what you're doing. But the thing that makes gin gin is the juniper berry. The juniperus communis must have the juniper in there. That's the thing that sets it aside from any sort of um, other botanical vodka or aquavit, which is actually quite a close cousin of it. And I think the interesting thing for gin um, that I think, particularly if you compare it to things like rum and whiskey and that, is essentially that base spirit that you use can be made out of anything. So it could be apple, it could be potato, it could be corn, which is quite popular in the US, it could be wheat, which is quite popular in the UK. Some places molasses is more popular. You see quite a lot of grape in Australia because they have such a great wine production there. And also in places like California and, uh, and uh, New York State, because again, there's great wine growing regions there. So a huge variety of the base, which is also something that now people are starting to explore as well. That's a really interesting distinction that you that you draw between gin and certain other spirits where there is a a restriction on what you can use. Uh, for example, bourbon re requires over 50 percent corn in the mash bill. And then there are other spirits like uh, particularly like a rum uh, or a rum agricole uh, where it must be distilled using only the cane juice of the of the sugar cane. Gin is also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, normally produced in something called a column still. Is that correct? The spirit that you would make the gin out of would typically be made in a column still, yes. Certainly in Europe, you have to have the base spirit has to be distilled up to 96% ABV. So it's a very high, very, very neutral, clean spirit. There'll still be some residual character there, but basically it's a pretty flavorless spirit. So that bit will be done in a column. Typically, the the actual distillation or technically redistillation of with the botanicals will be done often in a pot still. Some people use a column, but mostly it's done in um, a pot still. So you just imagine you have the kettle with your pot. You put the alcohol in there. Typically, you wouldn't put it in at 96%. It's way too high. You'd maybe do it 50%, 60%, something like that. You put the botanicals in. Maybe there's a maceration. Maybe there's not, just to help more of the flavor come out. And then you just distill that. And that's it's a very, it's a very simple process. Right, right. It seems like gin inhabits a different part of the spirit spectrum than the spirits that really focus on mash bill and the terroir that can be produced from that mash bill. It seem, seems like gin really focuses more on the addition of those other flavors. And so I was wondering if you might um, provide uh, just a quick list of some of the more popular herbs and spices that are, that are used to then flavor the base spirit. Yeah, of course. Um, so number one is obviously juniper. Uh, and that would be followed very closely by coriander seed. And actually, I think a lot of the flavor that people associate with gin isn't just the juniper, it's the coriander seed as well. And depending on where you get that coriander seed, that makes a huge difference as well. Russian coriander is slightly more citrusy than perhaps Canadian might be, and then you can get it from Morocco, and there's a lot of, lot of variation there. Then there's angelica root, um, which is often described as what gives gin its dryness. So again, those three, juniper, coriander and angelica, they're kind of the trinity of gin botanicals. And actually, you can make a pretty fabulous gin 
just with those three. Then you'd probably move on to some of the citruses, so things like lemon and orange. And then you have oris, which has a slightly, which is a powder, and it has a slightly floral flavour, but often that's used to kind of bind the flavours together and, and a sort of fixative to with these flavours just to help them keep their flavour integrity. Then after that, so that's like the top six, and they're the most populous that are used in gin, I would say, as well. And then after that, you start to move into some of the spices. So cardamom is quite popular, cinnamon and cassia as well, star anise, and then you move also to more citruses. I mean, there's a whole host of different citruses, limes, popular grapefruit, um, up to more bizarre things like the Australian finger limes are used in some gins and things like that. And then you've got floral as well. So it could be things like um, rose, lavender, violet, and then herbal things such as rosemary and thyme and bay leaf and things like that. Right, right. You mentioned an ingredient that I just had a quick question about, and that was orris. Is that the root of an iris? It is, yeah. It's the dried and powdered root of the Florentine iris, yeah. Okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure because I feel like um, many of our listeners probably haven't heard of that one, whereas some of the other more culinary and, um, you know, herbal ingredients people have probably run across. Yeah, it's not something that you would come across in everyday life. It's used quite a lot in the perfume industry. So I guess lots of listeners might have actually interacted with it, but probably through perfume, where it's used, again, to kind of bind these different scents together. It kind of just fills in the gaps between everything else and just brings it together, a bit like a catalyst almost. Okay, that's really interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about how you first began to fall in love with gin because at least here in the United States and, and for people, I suppose, in my generation and maybe even um, a little bit older since the, the gin kind of revolution has has been a more recent occurrence, uh, I guess, in terms of the number of gins that people have access to and the number of styles that we have access to. The typical sort of gin story, in my experience, tends to be one of sort of redemption in that uh, a lot of times people encounter it early in life. They have a really bad experience with it, and then they tend to avoid juniper. And when I when I find somebody who really loves gin, usually the story is that they've found one that they, uh, you know, that, that doesn't remind them of that first hangover after having a, just a really uh, generic kind of low-grade London dry gin with just tons and tons of juniper. Um, so I was wondering what your uh, story was, if if it's a redemption story or if you've always loved it, and um, just just curious to know. Yeah, I think it's a good point because I've certainly heard those sorts of stories quite a lot myself. So I think I got into gin when I was about 19, something like that. So that was 2005. And originally my interest was in vodka um, and I was interested in in that in that variation and I imagine as you can imagine someone that's interested in unflavored vodka and the variation that there is within that is obviously someone that's generally quite interested in taste and flavor and those sort of nuance and a bit geeky and a little bit obsessive about it almost but at the time what I felt was that there, it was impossible to get a handle on the world of vodka because there was just too much of it whereas at the time at that time Gins that were available were, there might be 30, 40, 50, something like that. The only American gins you could really get in the UK were things like Seagram's. You could get Junipero as well, 209. So, you know, some really nice gins, but there wasn't a lot that was available at that time. And almost it was a slightly pragmatic decision to move to gin, just because I thought, actually, you could get a good handle on it you could try most of what was out there and actually you could get some sort of expertise from that that was what i thought now i realize there's a lot <laughs> a lot of gin out there and the longer i go on the more i realize i don't know but there we go <laughs> yeah that's really interesting so have you always then worked kind of in the in the spirits world i've been interested in, in it and i've moonlighted in it for since then, um, I spent some time working in finance for a little while, but at the, at the same time, I was still far more interested 
in the spirit side of things, and even my dissertation at university, and I studied as an accountant, I managed to somehow get it round because it had to be business related to gin as well. So um, yes, it's always I, whilst that wasn't what I trained to do, I um, it's always been in the back of my mind, and now it's fabulous that this is what I do full time. That's excellent. That is that's a great story. So when did you decide? that the world needed the gin dictionary? Well, it's a, an interesting question. I think that there's a lot of interest in gin, and I think as that continues, there's also a little bit of confusion. And it was an opportunity that was presented to me. Someone said, we'd quite like you to write a gin dictionary. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a pretty, a pretty good idea. So that was the nice thing about it was actually I was approached to write this. and. I thought it would be a lot easier than it was. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's what many authors say uh, after after uh, looking back on their journey writing a book. <laughs> oh yes. So this is this was a, an opportunity that was brought to you. My my next question was going to be, who did you write this for? Like, what was your what was the ideal reader you were envisioning? But but I suppose maybe we can modify that question to be, what sort of person? would uh, really enjoy reading this book? I think, um, even back to the original question, it's anyone that has an interest and a passion for gin. So that can just be someone that's tried two or three different gins and go, oh, I quite like this, I quite enjoy gin tonic, and they get excited about the different flavours that are available, through to someone that's actually making, you know, they're making gin, and they're, they're, they're a distiller, and they're making things. I wanted to have that breadth. It's very much a, a book that you can dip in and dip out of. I wanted to write it so that it was technically accurate and had the the detail in there, but that was still accessible because um, I think it's so important to have knowledge about gin and that shouldn't be locked away from the general public. They should be able to understand pretty much all of the various things that they want to know. And the more they want to know, it should be there. Some people, hey, you're just happy to have a lovely gin tonic, nice martini, Negroni, whatever, and that's superb. But those people that want to learn more, if they want to dig a bit more, they can. And that's kind of what the book's somewhat designed for. You can use it as reference, or if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, it's all in there. Great. Have you ever come across a book called The Drunken Botanist by an author named Amy Stewart? Oh, yeah. Fabulous book. Fabulous. Uh, I really like the way that that book can serve as a reference guide or, or it's something that can actually be read straight through. So it, it seems like um, your book's trying to be also in that category of a, of a guide that can be picked up picked up and put down and, you know, just as you said, kind of dipped into. I really like that because when I need inspiration for something, I, I'll very often pick up that book, The Drunken Botanist. Can you tell us any more about the Gin Dictionary? Maybe um, you know the way it's set up, the best way to uh, to read it, or maybe some of the some noteworthy sections or topics in there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first thing to say is it was written with some, but written by someone that has a relatively short attention span, which is myself. So I don't know the last time I read a book cover to cover, because I'm very much more of a dip in and dip out, and so it's kind of it's somewhat written that style um, as concisely as possible so that it is easy to read there are different categories within that they're not they're, it's, it's alphabetical it's a dictionary but there are within it certain categories that i sort of identified when i was writing it so some things look at some of the history of gin some of them look at the cocktails some look at the very more technical and scientific points and even getting into the nitty-gritty of some of the chemical components of what are in the botanicals things like alpha pinene and beta pinene and linalool and actually when you start to look at those you understand why certain botanicals work so well together something that before i wrote the dictionary i had no idea about and i had to research to write it but that was absolutely fascinating certain things about styles of different gins as we were sort of talking about earlier and it was actually quite a nice place to do some particularly from the historical stuff, some of my sort of original research. So there's a few new things about the Gimlet and Young Tom Gin, which is kind of the forgotten cousin to Old Tom, um, and uh, 
also the gin and cola as well, which is a slightly more esoteric drink. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to put it. Since you brought it up, uh, this is a topic that we really haven't um, gotten into on the podcast as far as I can remember, and uh, I think that you're pretty qualified to, to speak on what Old Tom Gin is, and uh, you can also certainly throw in the, the, the new Tom uh, or the young Tom, but could you just talk about what that style of gin entails, um, because it is very unique. It is, yeah, and I'll it'll be um, kind of off the top of my head, crib note version. But essentially, where Old Tom had come from was the four continuous distillation in the um, in the sort of middle part of the 19th century. The the base spirit for gin was a lot rougher than we would have today, um, and and so you would have a very botanically intense gin to kind of cover up the impurities in the alcohol and it also might be sweetened as well to kind of again to cover up these sorts of impurities and that was essentially what you were looking at from an old tom and it might and it may well have been barrel aged as well i mean there wasn't stainless steel in these times so these things were being kept in barrels but it was kind of any impact of the wood was generally incidental but typically the things that you look for in Old Tom is botanical intensity, first and foremost, and some sort of sweetness. And it could be botanical sweetness, so like licorice root, which adds to sweetness, or cassia. Or it could be sugar, or it could be honey, or agave. There's a whole range of different things. And it may or may not be wood-aged, but um, I think you couldn't have a light and delicate Old Tom. It's just not what Old Tom was designed to do. Whereas, and there's very little about Young Tom, but from what I found is essentially it was a higher strength version of Old Tom, but there's very little um, reference to it. But that's essentially what I found a more an even more powerful gin than the Old Tom was. Interesting. Interesting. OK. And that style, uh, I imagine, is also enjoying as as distillers get more and more experimental and as some of the new distilleries have the opportunity to actually age or rest some of their spirits uh, before rushing them to market. I imagine that this style is, is getting a little bit more attention. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think that's 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 completely correct. And it's a great cocktail gin. I mean, I've seen some distilleries, they release something that they describe as their cocktail gin, and it's their gin for mixing. So they might have a normal gin for gin tonic, martini, that sort of thing. But if you want to make it a gin punch, you know, with fruit juices and stronger flavors and things like that, you might want to use their cocktail gin. And really, the difference is it's more botanically intense. So I think that in many ways, this cocktail gin and old Tom gin, they kind of go hand in hand. And so they're just that bit more mixable. Right, right. That's really interesting. Uh, are there any other trends in the world of gin that people, you know, just everyday people might not be aware of, but that they that, that you can kind of turn us on to? Yeah, I think. Um, and it's I, as a historian, I always find these things very interesting and lot, many, many things go full circle. So the big thing that you see a lot of in the UK and in Europe, and I think you're starting to see more of it in the US as well, are the rise of flavored gins or fruit gins and things like that. And it's easy to see, you know, with the with flavored vodkas where you had wedding cake and cookie cream and Swedish fish, fish flavored uh, vodkas and stuff. You think, oh, flavored gin, that's going to be terrible. But generally, the approach to flavored gin is a little bit this is slightly more genuine, because really what you're talking about is someone taking gin and then infusing some sort of fruit in there. Rhubarb is popular in Spain. Strawberry is very popular as well. And this is actually something that's very historical. Um, Gordon's gin in the 30s, they did an orange gin and they did a lemon gin. There's there's quite a lot of it in America as well. Uh, there was a pineapple gin in America. In San Francisco, there was an asparagus gin, which you may or may not have heard about. There was a whole range of different flavoured gins that were around. And that does seem to be bringing a lot more people into the world of gin. Um, as you were saying, people might have had a bad experience before and now they're coming into it with these slightly... F uh, sweeter, slightly fruitier flavors. So the fruit gin, the flavor gin is definitely uh, a trend, but with a historical background. 
the other thing, the really exciting stuff, which has sort of been coming out in the last couple of weeks, are some of the people that are starting to look at some of the old British styles of gin. So I'm sure many of your gin fans that are listening to the podcast and yourself will be familiar with Plymouth gin. But actually, now, finally, there's starting to be some evidence and also some products as well that are coming out with other regional styles that have a similar historical provenance to Plymouth. So Bristol gin is one example, um, and also Maidstone gin as well. So there's still research that needs to be done, but that's very much the forefront of some interesting stuff, and it's very much going back in time 200 years and seeing how they made gin. It's really quite exciting. Right, and can you just briefly explain how Plymouth gin is is different than, for example, a London dry style? So technically, Plymouth and Plymouth is a London dry gin. Of all the of all the technicalities, it's a London dry gin. Um, it doesn't typically it's not typically a different style. What the situation was with where it was made was it was it was granted a trademark at some point, and there's a lot of legal things around that and there actually were uh, there were two other distilleries in Plymouth I'm still again this is very new research still trying to find out exactly what their names were and things like that so there were other distilleries but because Plymouth Gin or Coates which is which was the the distillery at Blackfriars as Plymouth Gin we know today they had a couple of different uh, lawsuits and that was the thing that put them in the position that they then have this protected status. So, I mean, I guess Plymouth had those connections with the Navy and the different ships that were coming in. So there was that aspect of how things were being made. And they had the local uh, local access to the very soft Dartmoor water. So those would be certain things. But in terms of like the difference between a London Dry and an Old Tom, it wasn't the same. But there were still some slight regional differences there. And this is it's all stuff that we're still trying to figure out and pick apart. Right. So it sounds like even with as many developments as as we've seen in the past few years with gin, it seems like uh, there's there's still a lot to dig into. Definitely. Got it. So one thing I, I wanted to discuss, and you can, you can certainly tell me to pause if this is something that you were saving for the lightning round, but you sent along a fascinating picture to me via email. And I did. Yes. Are, are you saving this for the lightning round, or did... this, this was my uh, this was my uh, answer to question two? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, well, then, how about this? Shall we maybe get into the lightning round, and then? Yeah, sure. Perfect. So the first question that we always ask is, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've been interested in more recently? Favorite is always tricky, um, but I think it's important always to give an answer whenever asked these sorts of things. Uh, the drink I drink the most of, interestingly enough, is a whiskey soda. I, I don't really write about whiskey, but it's such an enjoyable drink to just unwind with. So literally just whiskey and club soda and ice. And I think a couple of favorite whiskies for that. Johnny Walker Green Label is really nice. The St. George Baller is fantastic, but it was designed for a highball anyway. Um, and some of the stuff from Spirit Works as well. Right, right. That's great. Uh, the the highball is definitely getting a lot of attention. And so is that something that, it's, uh, that you've always uh, enjoyed? I think so. I think yeah, for, for, for as long as I can pretty much remember, I think I've really enjoyed it because what I like about it is just because it's just the sparkling water. So you can still taste so much of the whiskey and you don't have all the sugar. And for me, it's the sugar that gives me the hangover the next day. So I find I'm quite a fan of gin and soda and, and a whole variety of different spirits and soda. But there's just something about scotch, scotch and soda or whiskey and soda that I really like. I think it's it was such a popular drink in the 60s and the 70s and some of the tv shows i used to watch growing up things like the saint and stuff like that they're always drinking whiskey soda and i think that's just uh part of the attraction for me <laughs> right right that's interesting okay so we are now on to this highly anticipated second question which is if you were a cocktail tool or ingredient what would you be so i gave this a little thought and i thought uh it's esoteric but i would be a martini tester largely because i really like uh martinis and who wouldn't want to be a martini tester right (laughs) 
So tell us about this. If you could describe this, and we'll certainly post your picture on the show notes page, but why don't you uh, give it a crack? So it's essentially an eyedropper. Um, it was around in the 60s, 70s, and this was the time when there was a huge amount of various and bizarre martini gadgets that came on the market. Tiffany did a small, like, looked like a very small oil can that you put the vermouth in and you sort of dribbled it in. There's the martini spike, which looks like a, it's a sterling silver syringe that you put the vermouth in. There's martini scales, martini stones, a whole load of different things. And this, um, the martini tester, is a way that if you were in a bar or potentially at your friend's house, although I don't know how they'd really feel about you uh, using the martini tester there, you can check how dry your martini is. So the martini tester consists of uh, an eyedropper, essentially, with three small balls in it. Um, so little plastic balls, a red one, a white one, and a, a blue one. And you take a sample of your martini up into the into the uh, eyedropper, and then depending on how the balls are floating, because it works on the specific gravity of the mix of gin and vermouth, it will tell you whether your martini is regular or dry or extra dry. That's fascinating. And that's essentially what it's for. And it works. It does work. Okay. So I have a couple of follow-up questions on this. This is It's, it's slightly suspicious to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what would you define, or based on your knowledge of, of – gin and martinis what do you think the definition of a quote-unquote regular martini is in terms of the ratio of gin to vermouth i think regular is probably something between two parts gin one part vermouth to uh, maybe three parts uh, gin to one part vermouth and of course dry vermouth as well because if you're using sweet or even a white sweet that's going to change the specific gravity because of the sugar in there but yeah i would say Two to one is probably regular. Okay, okay. And so a, dr a dry might be something like a four to one, and an extra yeah, dry would be a six or eight to one? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, dry is somewhere four, five to one, something like that. And then, yeah, like you said, six or eight to one for the extra dry. Mm, that's interesting. So <laughs> I, I just love this. I, I'm I'm – just so fascinated by this this little contraption. Was this ever something that was popular, or was it only ever sort of just a novelty? I th I think it was always an I think it was always a novelty. I have a actually have a small collection of different ones, and I think uh, it was um, originally it was something that Gilby's had as a promotional thing. There's a little booklet came with their bottles of gin about martinis. And it even has like details in it uh, as to some survey that was done where teachers generally, they have their martinis of a certain dryness and the people that have it the driest, I think like 10 to one were people that worked in publishing. And it was kind of this very interesting and again, esoteric, I use the word a lot, um, little booklet. And you could send off and pay, I don't know, a dollar seventy five because this was back in the 60s and they'd send you one. Um, so I've got one of those, but there are also a variety of different variations on it, and they look slightly different. And so I think that it must have been around for a while because there were that many varieties. I also think, because of some of the ones I have, it was one of these things that was given away as a sort of promotional item. So you know, like you might get pens or key rings or bottle openers today if you go to a trade show and you get your swag. I think it might have been a bit like that as well because I think there were certainly – nothing to do with um, martinis or gin or anything, and they have their branding on the side of the of the, um, of the the item. So I think it's also a promotional kind of gimmick as well. Right, makes sense. So whenever martinis come into the conversation, I am compelled by my own moral compass to, to ask, what is your ideal martini? Well, um, I, I, I am... Um, very open to lots of different styles of martini and i've heard your martini episode as well so i'm uh, uh, aware of, uh, of the things i might be saying now but uh, but i'm definitely an advocate of both stirred and shaken i think that they both have their their place and i know many many people will be uh, rolling their eyes or 
or dropping their monocles, but <laughs> but very much so. I think they both have places. I think if you want it colder and you want that aeration, then Shaken's really, really good. Typically, I'm about a four or a five to one ratio with the Vermouth. Could be Noily, could be Dolan, could be Lille. I mean, it's not te- technically a Vermouth, but I think it's very good. Always fine strain it so you don't get the little shards of ice. And just make sure that glass is cold. Absolutely. That's great. And uh, I, th- I think you and I are kindred spirits in that in that respect. So I think, in fact, the last martini I did order was a, was a four to one uh, with, a, with a twist. Um, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you talk about? What would you drink? Just sort of paint a picture for us. So, and this fits in again to the martini, because the martini is my drink of choice, and I'd have it with uh, Sir Roger Moore of James Bond and the Saint fame, as so you can see a bit of a theme here. Certainly Bond and the Saint have had uh, quite an influence on me, um, not just drinking, but just the style and just their approach to things in some ways. More the Saint than James Bond, in honesty, to be fair. But <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, and so I remember reading an article where he'd done an interview and he actually gave his recipe for his preferred way of making a martini, which is quite an interesting one. So that would be the recipe I'd quite like. And whilst they do fantastic martinis in their own right, I think I would be the place to, to, to enjoy it would be uh, Duke's hotel in, um, in St. James in London, lovely hotel does absolutely fantastic uh martinis if any of your listeners are ever in london i would say that's the place you've got to go i mean we have there's some fantastic you know the savoy and langham and artisan and uh, there's, there's lovely bars but i really like dukes and you want to go in the afternoon as well i think just one martini in the afternoon sat there just chatting not chatting about james bond or anything like that just chatting because i think it was such a everything i've heard about him was such a nice chat and then maybe we'd have a little mooch up to Fortnum and Mason's, which is just around the corner, and have a look in the food court, sample a few things, buy some jam, that sort of thing. <laughs> huh, beautiful. A nice uh, nice little afternoon with Roger Moore. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever been so crushed as when I was I was dry my wife and I were on a long drive and she was looking up all those all these little personality quizzes that you can take online on her phone you know like so uh, w- which Harry Potter character are you and all these other things and so we got to the uh, which James Bond are you and I took the test and I gave her my answers as I was driving and then she goes Oh, it looks like you're Timothy Dalton. And I was like, I was never so crushed as when I was the <laughs> Timothy Dalton James Bond. That was just of all the all the other options, I was Timothy Dalton. So take that for what it's worth. I hope that's not a reflection of my my personality or my my, uh, I, my personal worth in this world. Well, I would the um, I, as you probably guess, I'm quite upon Van. Uh, Timothy Dalton's portrayal is probably one of the closer ones to the literary Bond, actually. So. It is true. It maybe, is true. So maybe, maybe that's a consolation. Maybe it's yes. not. <laughs> <laughs> You've saved me. Thank you. Are there any books about gin or cocktails that have been particularly influential or enjoyable for you? Uh, yes, there's two. One, I don't even keep in my bookcase. I keep it in the cupboards or one of the cupboards where I keep my uh, bottles because um, I use it that much. Um, and that is the essential cocktail by Dale de Groff, which I, is just my go-to. If I can't remember immediately, oh, how do you make an amaretto sour or whatever it might be, that's the book I go to. I think it, it's so so well written. It's my copy is very well sort of summed through because it's been used so much. And 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 I actually got to meet Dale in uh, Berlin and I got him to sign it for me, which was pretty fantastic. So I was very pleased about that as well. Oh, um, excellent. So that's a, that's a really, it's just a fabulous book. The other one is a slightly less well-known book, but there was a book called, it was essentially, there was two, two different editions. One was a, uh, a wine and spirits dictionary, which was written by a, a chap called Peter Hallgarten. And he also then also wrote a book called Le Cures, which is again by Peter Hallgarten. And these are, 
They're written in, I think it was in the 70s, and it's a snapshot of what was going on, particularly the Wine and Spirits one, a snapshot of what was going on at that time with spirits and liqueurs. And in terms of research and trying to work out what was going on there or going on before the research, I've looked at things like Pim's Cups and stuff like that. Those books were so, uh, his books are so invaluable. And I think something I'm very aware of at the moment is that we have, oh, we have all the, you know, we have the internet and we have an Instagram and all these various other things. But is anyone actually recording what's going on now so that in 20 or 30 years time, is it going to be easy for people to work out actually when did um, Saint Germain come along or whatever the variations of those sorts of things might be. And actually, when I've been looking at some of the cocktail history, some of the harder things to find the origins of are the more modern drinks. They're not the stuff from the 19th century, but they're the stuff from the 70s or the 80s or even like within the last 10 years. And I think it's really important that to some extent, us as writers and broadcasters need to uh, uh, chronicle what's going on as well at the same time. For sure. Yeah, we can't just be sitting here soaking it all in. We actually have to uh, remember to uh, to write it down. So that's a that's a really, really good point. And we will link to both of those books in the show notes so that folks can check them out and try and get their hands on them if they're interested. Lovely. Thank you. If you could give any piece of advice to someone who's just beginning their journey as a home bartender uh, or a cocktail enthusiast, what advice would you give? These are, I have two tips, and they're both related to temperature. First one is make some space in your fridge. You just need space in your fridge. You need it for your club soda. You need it for your tonic water, for your vermouth. You've got to keep that dry vermouth in the fridge. A whole range of different things. But you just, you know, you need to almost realize that that potentially, if you're really getting into it, that the fridge is secondarily for food. (laughs) Primarily, certainly, that's how how uh mine is because certainly with sodas and like i said tonic waters and that if they're not chilled before you pour them they're going to be sweeter and they're not going to be so fizzy so i can't uh, emphasize enough the importance of having chilled carbonated mixers if you're going to use them and then the other thing is get yourself a good ice tray don't use the ice tray that came with your your freezer or your fridge freezer and even some of the ice that comes from the dispensers even that is not that great of quality. So I think you need really need to invest in like a nice solid silicon tray, which provides you with sort of, you know, inch cubed ice cubes, at least to start. And then there's definitely places for much larger and ice balls and things like that. But just on a starting level, just something that can provide you pretty decent, regular ice cubes that you can use in a whole host of different things. That's worth a little bit of investment in. Right. I agree. I'm, I'm with you there. And I think that's really practical advice and, uh, something that's also pretty low cost. Making yep. space in the fridge doesn't cost anything. And, uh, and an ice cube tray is an easy, easy starter. So very good advice. And before we sign off here, I, I want to make sure that people have two bits of information. The, the first, uh, would be obviously, how to best get a hold of the gin dictionary. And then the second would be how to digitally connect with you if they have any questions about international spirits judging or gin. So just a, whatever your, your preferred mode of online or social media communication would be there. Sure. So gin dictionary is available on, I think on most online and physical bookshops and in terms of getting in contact with me, my personal website is summerfruitcup.com. So if think of sort of PIMS, that kind of style. The Twitter is at summerfruitcup. And you can email me at david at summerfruitcup. Beautiful. <laughs> well, that is, that's perfect. And uh, we're very excited to also be uh, giving away a free signed copy of the Gin Dictionary with this episode as well. Fabulous. Yep. Great stuff. David, thank you so much for your time. Maybe at some point down the road, we can do a follow up and maybe talk more in depth about spirits competitions or summer fruit cups. But I'm really grateful that you took the time to take us through a little bit more about gin. Sounds fabulous. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. 
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Botanical Wisdom by David T. Smith, and a little interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.